Hello and welcome to another edition of another book review. This week I'll be reviewing The Ten Year War by Jonathan Cohn. I'll talk very briefly about the author, go into an overview of what the book is about, talk about what I liked about it, talk about what I didn't like about it, who I'd recommend book to, and I think we'll end up there for this week. I'm not quite sure what I'll be reading for next time. Uh, Jonathan Cohn is a writer with Huffington Post. He's also uh, has worked for The Atlantic as well as, I believe, written for The New York Times. He's kind of most famous known for writing on the health beat of those things and is l largely regarded as an expert in that space. Uh, this book, uh, The Ten-Year War, is about the le piece of legislation that eventually became the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, and the repeal, uh, the attempted repeal of that by the Trump administration, uh, and ends roughly in 2020. Uh, as far as the coverage, he also, the first, I'd say, 50 pages or so of the book is a history of the push for universalized health care from the uh, Roosevelt and Truman uh, administrations to the LBJ administration to the Clintons' push for uh, expanded health care in the early 90s uh, to the bulk of the book. It was really the creation of the ACA legislation and going into the weeds of that. So one of the things that's really, you notice off the bat is I think he does a really good job of getting access to really important people. So you get really a full history of this legislation. He tries to interview people on both sides and does, I think, an adequate job of trying to show both sides of the perspective. Uh, healthcare is always this very uh, complex, nebulous system. There are winners, there are losers, there's tons of special interests. And I think he tried really hard to get into all that. So he really saw the weeds uh, and you saw really the sausage being made, as it were. I think he also does something that I don't see often enough that I did really appreciate. He puts forward his own biases in the beginning of the book and says, you know, if it was up to me, I would uh, push for a, a European-style universal health care system. Uh, so that may, in the course of writing this book, influence some of my opinions and some of what you're seeing. So I really appreciate that. You don't oftentimes get uh, authors laying out their biases, but he does that. That being said, I think he does do a good job of trying to get opposing viewpoints on, on things. There's a couple points where I would take issue with some of the things he said. I'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, for the most part, I think he is as balanced as he can be on this in terms of getting, uh, re getting more conservatives on the record, trying to show how thorough the legislation was. I think he does also a good job of showing, you know, he at the end of the book kind of talks about the reticence of the Republicans, but he also shows... While the ACA was being written, I don't think the reticence of Republicans was really a surprise to anybody, and I think oftentimes that's how it's portrayed in the media. They're, pretty, they're really clearly resident <laughs> the entire time, and so the number of Republicans they were going to get on for the legislation would have always been minimal, if, if any at all. It was really the bare minimum to call it bipartisan, which I don't think they received, but the idea that it was this, this kind of surprise is, is, is a falsehood. And I think he does a good job of showing, like, Point after point, this is what the media thought at the time. This is what we see now through my reporting. And I think he does do a very good job of showing a much more expansive, um, a, a really more expansive view of all these things. He also kind of goes into how there's what he calls a wonk gap, which I thought was interesting between Democrats and, and Republicans in terms of there's much many more Democrats who are working on this universalized, universalized health care and expanded health care system for a, a very long, really long time. And it kind of showed in the uh, 2000, I guess, 17 push to repeal the ACA and how just the Republicans were really just not equipped to do that uh, in any real meaningful way. That's not as much of the book. The book is really the bulk of it is the, the creation of the legislation, but that part of it is there as well. Um, I think he does, like I said, do a good job of giving a, an honest shake to everybody. If there are some things that I was surprised that were omitted, you know, the creation of the ACA legislation uh, was all came on the backdrop of the 2008 financial crisis. This isn't really so much of an omission for me reading it because I remember that time I was alive and I just thought it colored everything about the Obama presidency and, and everything of the last, between 2008 to really when Trump was elected in 2016, that was a huge part of it. And not that it, he completely admits it, but it's not as present as you would think. Given uh, given how huge of an event it was, and so I, it's really more of for people who are reading this in the future, or for younger people than me, to read it and just go, well, you know, 2008 financial crisis really impacted all these things, and I was surprised at how little it gets mentioned in this. 
But politically, that was a huge deal and would have influenced many of the decisions that people made. And oftentimes, that thought process just isn't there. Uh, the biggest part that I, I found kind of confusing is uh, he talks a little bit. The individual mandate comes out throughout the book. Uh, and I think he does a good job of explaining what it is and some of the attacks against it and also some of the criticisms of it at a very, very high level, meaning a legal level. He, all, he does not, the one thing that I, I, kind of part where I was surprised of how ill the reporting was, he doesn't find any individuals to talk to about how the individual mandate was unfair to them or they felt it was a tax, a fine, a penalty, whatever we want to call it this week, and, and it was maybe an unjust one of whatever you fill in the blank is. He does find people who benefited from the ACA, individuals, several of them through the book. He interviews those people, but I was expecting him to also find someone who would just say, you know, in my opinion, this thing shouldn't have, shouldn't have existed. It kind of goes against my sense of fairness. And the people he found uh, were really more, like I said, think tank folks and not individuals. And I found that kind of noticeable, that that really wasn't there. And he, in a similar way, because Jeffrey Tubin also reports on this in one of his books, he kind of touches on John Roberts, the possible logic of why the ACA was upheld in the, I think, I believe it's Sabella's case, probably mispronounced the name, so I apologize. There's a 2012 case about whether or not the individual mandate invalidated the, the ACA as a whole. Um, I wish he had a little bit more detail there, and I wish he had talked to a little bit, again, maybe more of the common person in, in that, uh, but he kind of backs up Tubin's belief, which is that the reason for Roberts saving the ACA was, may have been more political than anything else. Um, the other thing that I, I've, I thought of that in, in another Part of it that I was surprised I didn't see. From my understanding, part of the payments for the, um, and I wish he had either confirmed this or, or denied it, refuted it. Part of the pay for for the subsidies was the aforementioned uh, individual mandate. It was also a medical sales device tax, as well as savings from bringing the federal student loans into the DOE to cut out the middleman. My understanding is that the pay fors for the individual subsidies were from that. He doesn't really bring that up. Uh, I wish he had kind of mentioned that, how much, where the pay-fors were all coming from. And usually I would say, well, it's a wonky book, so it's really not that big of a deal. But it's a 340-page book full of tons of wonkiness, and so I'm surprised that that didn't kind of get sussed out. Again, he would have had to go into the individual mandate, why exactly people didn't feel that it was fair, who actually paid for it, which he doesn't mention either in the reporting my understanding is mostly working poor people, people making twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year, were the folks who paid the individual mandate, and that doesn't really get brought up. And so there's some omissions there that I think fit into kind of the bias that he was talking about before. And I wish that he had maybe brought more of that in to give it a balance. And it was surprising because I think again he does a good job of showing, uh, I thought. Uh, non-biased opinion for most of the book, but there's one that was one place where I saw it and I was like, I wish you had brought more of this in. And maybe it's one of those things where he didn't want the book to be 500 pages. I understand that to some level. But I, that I did, I was bothered by that. And then finally, there's parts where I think he kind of contradicts his message. At one point, he thinks, you know, when he is kind of summarizing the book, he says a lot of the uh, problems with Obamacare came to people's resistance against Obama himself, which is certainly true. But he also then goes on to say that, you know, the level of faith in government has been falling since the 1960s and doesn't seem to tie those two things together. He also at one point points to the people who were opposed to the, uh, what were very similar plans in the early 90s by the Clintons, but then compares those to Obama, which again is true. And you could look at through the prism of the, the kind of controversies of the Obama administration, or you could look at it as the other events that happened between those two time periods, including the Clinton impeachment, including uh, Bush v. Gore, 9-11, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the 2008 recession, and then ask yourself, are any of those, were any of those events going to make you more trusting of the government or less trusting? And so a 20% gap there may be pretty explainable. And to me, I wish he, again, really smart guy, really clearly knows his stuff. I wish he had maybe taken that extra step to say, is it possible to think about these other things? And I think, again, he does a good job of, of trying to show different viewpoints. He doesn't come down and say, this is true, this is this, this is that. Um, so that those are my feelings of the book. Who would I recommend this book to? If you've ever wanted to know 
what went into the ACA specifically or just any major piece of legislation and how uh, complex and how many moving parts there are. I think it's really good for that. He summarizes the everything before the ACA relatively quickly, but I think that even really even anything before the Clinton administration in terms of healthcare benefits is explained super quickly to get you to kind of the meat of the book. I thought that was really good. He also sums up the Bush administration, the I think it's Medicare Part D was the uh, pharmaceutical expansion. I still don't quite understand what exactly happened in that bill, so I was a little confused by that, but in the huge scope of what we're talking about, it, it really does, didn't matter that much. Um, but otherwise, I really enjoyed the book. I think it was extremely well written. I think it was extremely well researched. The problems that I have, I still have with the, the book, and, and those are maybe small for some people. Maybe it was larger for me um, as someone wanting to see how the individual mandate played into this because I, I, I think he does point out at many points in the book that it, is, it was the least popular provision of the whole thing. Um, I wish he had maybe focused on that a little bit more. But that's The 10-Year War by Jonathan Cohn. Uh, if you like the video, please uh, give me a like on the video itself. Subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, I'll leave my Twitter link below. Until next time, bye.